I learned a lot from this experience for my first time. I thought it was like I've had a good day working yeah. with my students and having them meet Beth Erland, who is a professional artist, making a living with batik, and they were just amazed that this could be done. Beth is a master of the art of batik. She learned the Indonesian method of batik while in Japan. In addition to the janting tool and brushes for applying the wax, Beth uses and recommends carrying a small pad for daily watercolor sketches. Beth is also the author and illustrator of three children's books. Here come the students. Let's begin. What's today's date? Today is... I did let them know that you are talented students, that you do understand some of the basics of, you know, primary colors, etc. Because Miss Erland uses primary colors for her dyes, and that we went over a little bit about batik, but nowhere near what she can teach us. Um, she can tell us also about Artfest downtown and how to sell art. So any questions that you have or that you guys have sketch work as homework and sometimes wonder why I make you sketch something over and over or from a different angle and she's going to give you a little sense of how she uses her sketches. My name is Beth Erland and uh, when I started I was a scientist not an artist. Uh, I grew up, yeah, I grew up in a, in a small town in Texas and we didn't have art. And except to the fifth grade, and the last grade I got in art was a U because it meant unsatisfactory because I was talking and missed the assignment. I didn't get the assignment to go fast enough to turn it in. So I made a bad grade, but I can always draw, and I like to draw. My parents did not see art as a way to make a living, so they didn't encourage that. My dad was a teacher, but he was a science teacher, and he, he liked science, and I liked science, and so it just made sense. So when I went to college, I majored in zoology and chemistry, got a degree in that, went and did research. I read a lot, and I, I went to meet art museums a lot, and I played with art a lot, just by reading books and trying what the books said to do. I did a lot of drawing. I could draw pretty much anything I saw, and uh, but I wasn't trying to make original things necessarily. If I saw a building, I could draw it, or saw a person, I could draw it. And so uh, the art was very much a sideline for me. It was just something that was really fun to do. I was married. I put my husband through medical school, doing research, and then he got sent to Japan in the military, and I didn't have to work. In Japan, you can do a lot of art. There's a lot of art. Uh, the Japanese actually consider their artists as national treasures. So it's very good to be an artist in Japan. Some people who are really good artists to do it. And in a six weeks class, they ask the same question six weeks later that they asked the first day. They never got the process. So it, and it doesn't have anything to do with your artistic ability. It has to do with the way your brain thinks. But you're working in a negative basically. You're you're gonna draw and you're gonna draw so something reads in a few colors. <clears throat> Does that make sense to you? You know that we're gonna draw uh, more graphic, kind of like if you had to draw a picture in black and white and you had to make uh, somebody be able to recognize that it was a person, even recognize who that person was by what you put in. The middle values, the grays, all become either black or white. And in batik, you just expand that out a little bit and you use colors. You look at my sketchbooks, and I'll, I'll pass this one around. This is just one that I use. I have a lot of drawings that I do. Sometimes I'm just bored and I sit and draw. Sometimes you'll see in my little watercolor book, this is people that were at a show, I was doing an art show. And I was sitting in my booth and I just, if they were sitting, standing around for any length of time, I would, I would draw them. People talking on their cell phone are easy to draw because they're standing there. 
Uh, they get uncomfortable if you're drawing in, and they realize that you're drawing them sometimes, and they'll move because they don't like it. But you can do a, a quick sketch, and if you learn to do this, it will in improve your drawing so much if you draw really fast. If you only have 30 seconds to draw something, you'll learn how to draw it really fast. You'll learn what's important, what are the important things to make that say that's a person standing there, that's a dog. Uh, if you have more time, you can spend more time drawing. Uh, what I what I do when I'm going to do a picture, I will do a pretty a more detailed drawing, and then I will actually go back and figure out what I really need to put on the cloth. All the batik that I do is done on cloth. So when uh, let me find the drawing for this little crow that's in here. That was my drawing for this crow, and I drew him on the cloth, but I didn't put all the detail, and I don't know if you can, if you'll be able to see him, but he's, I just drew the basic outline of the crow on the cloth. Here there's more detail. I have photographs of crows that I've used, and that way I can make sure that I get it right, but I'll, I don't draw all the detail on my cloth. I also go back in and I, I will, when I'm traveling, I keep, I do little sketches and little watercolor sketches. This is a really easy way to, when you travel, but even at home. If you get a little book and you, you do little drawings, you can get little watercolor sets like this that are easy to handle. You can carry them in a backpack and you don't need a lot of space, a lot of things to work with. Write down what you saw, what you thought, because you'll forget. You think you won't, but you'll forget. So you want to keep as much information as you can. Uh, I did this one the other day from a boat. I was, I was out on a boat with a friend of mine, and I just took my little watercolor sketches and just a little sketch. Uh, and here I also have some people that were sitting at a coffee shop. They were talking. They were across from my booth at a show. Uh, this man was reading a paper. He was easier to do because he never moved. He was reading, and so he stayed uh, still. But if you practice drawing fast, you'll get better and better at drawing. And little books like this are not real expensive, so you don't have to spend a lot of money, and the watercolors go uh, really fast, and they're easy. I really recommend drawing every day. If you can do a little drawing every day of something, it doesn't have to be anything good, and it's not for anybody else. It's for you. That little book is my reference book. It's not meant for the teacher. It's not meant for your parents. It's not meant for anybody else. It's meant for you to have a record of things that you saw in your life that hit you one way or the other. You write about it. You do little drawings. All of you are artists, so the sketch is going to be, your visualization of that, what you're seeing, is really important to you in the long run. I do a lot of field sketches in the wells. When I travel even to Africa or to Scotland or Central America, I take my oil paints with me, and I take my watercolor books, and I do little sketches. Those are not necessarily for sale. They're called plein air sketches, and they're meant for me to be able to go back and make a final product. So when I've decided, I've, done, I've got all this information, I've got everything together, I will do the drawing on cloth, and it's in pencil, because the pencil will disappear as I begin to do it. If you do it in pen, it's not going to, it will not uh, stay. It'll stay there, and it'll, and some inks bleed, and you don't want that to bleed on your cloth. So I do a little drawing. I'm going to draw by color, and I'm going to draw everything I want to stay white. The wax is going to seal the cloth where I draw with it. So when I draw, when the cloth is white, it's going to stay white all the way through. If I have white in a picture, that's what I'm going to draw first. And it doesn't matter where it is in the picture. It doesn't matter if it's in an animal, a person, or the background, the foreground. You're going to draw everything by color. So you draw all the white, and then you dye the cloth the lightest color. And that's what I've done here. I'm going to show you in a minute, but I'm going to go through this first so that you kind of get a feel for it. This has been dyed one time. 
And the part that I drew with wax stayed white. And you can see it, even though the, the color is light, the dye is light, I, I, uh, you can see where the other part stayed white. When I draw with the, what I want to stay this color with wax, I'm going to dye it the next color. It'll, there'll be parts that are this color and parts that are white. And I will continue to do that all the way through. My batiks are dyed 30 to 50 times, so needless to say, we're not going to get one done. I'm not going to get one done today. I'm going to let you play with it. But um, you, it takes a long time to finish a piece. It takes me about a week to make a small one like this. So it's not fast. But each color has to dry before you go to the next color. So I, I do one color, and then I will dye it and hang it up to dry, and do another color, another piece, and hang it up to dry, and do another piece and hang it up to dry. So I will have anywhere from five to eight pieces going at one time. I try to do different subjects so that none of them are boring to me. I don't want to do five trees with birds flying out of them at the same time. I will do maybe one of these, uh, maybe uh, a boat, uh, maybe other birds, a giraffe. I'll do all different stuff in different sizes so that each one is real fun for me. Otherwise it would really be a drag. If you try to make the same thing over and over again, it is it, it kills you. It kills your artistic um, feelings and, and I don't recommend that. Um, so I will continue to dye at the end when I have all of the all the colors done that I need. I will take an iron and I'll iron off the wax and I iron it onto a board. This is actually a piece of cloth that's been wrapped around a board. And at uh, most of the wax gone now. There's a little bit in there, and it's it's there to preserve the cloth so that the the cloth can get wet and it wouldn't hurt it. But um, then I go back in and I add a different kind of wax, and we'll I'll show you some of that after I show you the batik thing. I want to explain about the dyes. I have three dyes over there. I have just primary colors. I only buy five. Dyes. The dye come in a powder. The kind of dye I use is called fiber reactive. It actually forms a chemical bond with the fibers, which makes it very, very permanent. So I, I mix, I have three blues, one red, and one yellow. Uh, the navy blue is my darkest one, and I can use, I use that to make black. I make black with navy, red, and yellow. Every color is made from that. And, I, and if you look at my work, you can see I have a lot of of colors in my work, but I, I make it every color. Each color affects the next color. So when you, if you dye your batik blue and you wax it blue and then you dye it yellow, it's not going to turn yellow, it's going to turn green. So you have to learn how to layer your colors so they work. I do use bleach because bleach will bleach, the, you can bleach out some of the colors when they're lighter, except for red. Red bleaches to hot pink, and you have nowhere to go with hot pink except for orange or brown or black. It, it, hot pink is, is not good. I mean, it, it's good if you want hot pink, but then you're going to have nothing else after that except for a, a few colors. So any dye that has a red dye in it is going to be, if you bleach it, if you bleach tan, tan has red in it. If you bleach tan, the yellow and the blue are going to come out and... Uh, the red is going to turn hot pink, and you're going to have hot pink. So you're not, even though it looks like you're working light to dark, you're not really working light to dark. You're working kind of light to dark. The blue dyes are the weakest, and so you can bleach them. So I do my blue dyes first, and I'll do them all the way through almost to dark blue. And then I bleach it. And then I do my yellows. And then I do my reds. So it's, it's a sequencing. If you're going to do a batik yourself, what you really want to do is do a very simple design where the colors go together. Because using the tools to do batik is not the easiest thing. But the colors are even harder than the, the tools. So once you learn how to use these, then you can start experimenting more with the colors. So if you make a batik, what you want to do is make one that the colors all go together. You know, a couple of shades of blue, maybe some yellow in there that's going to be green and then you green and red make brown so then you can go to 
brown and black. So you, you can make a sequencing of colors that's not, you can make a good picture. Make a real simple design. Don't try to do like what I'm doing so much now where I'm drawing so many colors. Make it simple. Draw it graphically so that you, you're making a picture read in a few colors, not so many. And this tool is called a jaunting. It has a hole here and it has a hole there. The wax goes in the big hole and it comes out the little hole. And when it's hot, it comes out pretty fast. And it, if you watch it, it's going to slow down more and more. Eventually it doesn't come out anymore because it's, it's cooler. If you want it to, to draw a big space, you're going to want it to be coming out fast. If you want it to not draw a big space, you need to wait till it's not coming out hardly at all. And then you draw with it. If you use a brush, the biggest problem people have with brushes is that the brush is, this is hair, so it doesn't stay hot. That's metal, it stays hot. This is going to cool really fast. If you put this on your cloth, what's going to happen is it's not going to go through the back side. So what do you think is going to happen with the dye? It's, going to, it's not going to, it's going to go through, it's going to dye it. So if you, the parts that, that the wax didn't go all the way through the cloth, to the back side, they're going to take the next color. If you, you may think you did it on the front side, you have to always check the back side and see. If you don't check the back side, what's going to happen is when you put it in black dye, the whole picture is going to turn black. When you take the wax off, you'll think, oh, I did such a good picture, and then you look at it and then you stick it in black dye and black went into everything. It, it's, the brushes appear to go faster, but they're not really faster. You have to go real slow with them. And you can't use little brushes. You have to use fat ones because they're the ones that are going to hold the wax hot the most. I use very little brushes except for uh, special effects. I'm trying to get clouds, and, and, and I'm trying to get where maybe the wax doesn't go all the way through. It'll give you a blending kind of effect. Then I use the brushes. Or if I have a big area that's one color, you can use a brush to do that. But otherwise, don't get thinking that you can use a brush because it'll, it'll mess you up. The jaunting is a much better tool. Uh, it does take a little bit of drawing time. If you use something to put your, your jaunting on like this to carry it over to where your cloth is, you're not going to drip in places you don't want to drip. So, and you can also test and see how fast is that wax coming out? And you can look at it, and and then you can say, okay, that's running. It's going to run faster on the cloth than it does on this, but at least you have an idea that it's not it's not more than what you can handle. So what I'm going to show you is, and I'm not going to say that because that's too tall. I'm going to show you how I draw with the wax, and it may not be exactly this way, the way this one was, but it's going to be close enough. Uh, I have a, a line that the bird is sitting on, and I want that to be white because uh, I want it to look like the light is catching it. So I'm going to draw, and if you can't see, stand up. You know, just stand up so that you can see. Uh, and I'll show you when I'm done. I'll show you what I what I did. The wax is just going to run out. When I get to where the feet are on the line, I have to stop, I go back, and I have to do it again. I'm going to go all the way across, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't take any wax, so you can go back and you can actually kind of move it. But yeah, if you want to move in closer, you can. Um, I also need to put some light. You have to think about where is the light going to hit this crow. Well, it's going to hit him on the top of the head, so I need to have a little bit of light on his head. Until it's not running too fast. And put a little light on the head, a little light on the beak, and a little bit under his eye and an eye spot. And that is all the white on that part, but I want to put clouds in the piece. So I'm going to take a brush and I'll put it moving up here so you can kind of see. And I'm just going to do the, the, the light parts of the cloud, the white. Because you, you have to know clouds if you're going to do them. Clouds are not just white clouds. They're, 
They have a lot of colors in them. But the lightest part will. Now what I, what I want is to make sure that around this crow's head is very light. I don't want it to be dark. I don't care if it gets dark around other parts of him, but I want his head to be highlighted. Take this and, and, and dye it. But if we pretend that I've already dyed it, and I, I'm going to go over there and dye it in a minute, but if we pretend that I'm going to dye it, this is, this is what I've got drawn so far. Not a lot. So then, if we pretend that I've already dyed it, and this is the, this is, it dyed, then I'm going to draw what I want to stay this color. This is some of the cloud color. So I'm going to go and put wax on that. And when I get close to the crow's head, I'm going to use my jaunting because that is much more precise than this brush. This brush is not really precise, but it, that's what you want. You want it to look kind of soft edges. And if you look at the back side, you see where it didn't, it, the wax didn't meet the white mat, the white didn't meet this little beige color. Okay, I have to go back on the back side and seal that up. Otherwise, the next color would go in there and in the next color and the next color and eventually you'd have a black line or a dark line between where you want the two lighter lines. So you have to go back on that back side and make sure that you've waxed that side. You have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, what kind of cloth is that? Is that cotton? This is silk. silk. But I would, what I brought for you guys to mess with today is um, our coffee filters because they're easier to, for the wax to penetrate through. And they don't, they don't cost very much and it's a great way to practice. So, um, it, and if you're going to do batik in the beginning, don't use silk. It's expensive and uh, if you screw up, it makes you really feel bad. So, cotton is, is inexpensive. Uh, this is not a, a real expensive media to do. The dyes are not very expensive. You can keep them for a pretty long time if you take care of them. Uh, the, the most expensive part is the beeswax. And I buy my beeswax from a beekeeper. So you, uh, and, bee, and then it's cheaper if you buy from a beekeeper. So it's not a lot. Yeah. Where else could you buy this wax? The mixture is beeswax and paraffin. So you just have to buy them separate? Yeah. Well, you can buy what is made, they call batik wax, but then you don't know how much of what's in what. You can crack the wax. If you want a lot of those cracks in the picture, you put a lot of paraffin in because it's a brittle wax. If you don't want so much, you put a lot of beeswax in. So if you're doing the face of a young person, you don't want it to look all old and wrinkly. So use a lot of beeswax. If you're doing an old person, it'll help, or if you're doing bushes, you want a lot of cracks to look like branches. Then go back in and use a lot of paraffin. So you can change your mixture. When I mix it, I mix about 50-50. Uh, but then I have another burner, and if I'm doing specific stuff, like a lot of skies, I don't want a lot of cracks in. So I might add a lot of beeswax so that I get a cleaner sky and then add more paraffin for the other parts. Two different waxes, like you get uh -huh. two different heads. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly, exactly. So it, it really, um, it becomes a science and if you get into doing it, then you really, you start experimenting with stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to like, make the wax? Mm -mm. No, you just you, you just uh, break off some wax. I use a just a hammer and a uh, a chisel, and I take off chunks. You can use a screwdriver even, and you just break off chunks of wax and you melt them. I use a double boiler because then I don't have to worry about it catching on fire. the The flash point of wax is a lot higher than the boiling point of water, so if you keep it in a water uh, pot. And you don't have to have a fancy pot like this. You can just get two old pots. And, but do get one that has a handle. Because if for some reason you were to have a fire, you want to be able to pick up that handle and remove that unit from the fire part. Okay? But um, I've never had a fire. Uh, and I've done it for 35 years. So it, it, 
the idea is to keep water, keep it in a water bath. It also keeps the temperature the same, so then your wax is going to run the same, and you'll know what it's doing, and you just keep adding water. This particular closed system, this is a fondue pot. That's what it's really for. But it works really well because it keeps the water from evaporating quite as fast. But you can do cheap. You don't have to even go to a garage sale and buy some old pots. And The brushes, you want cheap brushes. You don't want expensive ones. You want fat, cheap ones, or you can get nylon brushes at the hardware store uh, that are just little nylon brushes, easy. Th these tools are very inexpensive. They're about five bucks a piece. And you, they will, if you don't leave them in your wax pot between the times you, you heat them up and you turn the wax pot off, they'll last you 20 years. And you don't have to clean them or anything. You just, you just when you're done with doing your batik, you take them out of the pot. Because these are, are uh, soldered on, and the solder will come undone if it stays hot for too long. But we're talking a long time. And that heating up and cooling down process makes that tip come off. But otherwise, you know, once you buy, and buy a couple because these, the tips are hand pulled, and so each one runs differently. They don't run the same. And you'll see it when you mess with this stuff. This one runs different than this one, even though they're both called number ones. But there's number one, number two, number three. I don't use anything but number ones. Twos and threes are big, and the wax really goes out fast. And for the kind of detail I do, I don't, I don't want that. I'll use a brush if I want something to go out really fast. So it's inexpensive that way. The, the dyes are not expensive either, and you don't need a lot of them. So you can, and you can buy cotton pretty cheap. If you buy cotton at the store, you need to wash it first because it has a sizing, a starch in it. That's a, it's called sizing, and that messes up your both the way that it takes the wax and the the dyes. But once you've got the, all the part done that's this color. Let me quick do this and then I have to the time here because um, I want you guys to have a chance to do it. You just, I'm just adding a little bit more wax and then I'm going to put this, both of these in dye. And then I want you to come up here and play with it. And you, uh, Ms. Williams asked me to talk about putting the music in and I'll do that real, real quick. I uh, I started adding music this uh, past spring because somebody asked me to do a poster for a music festival. And I thought what I would do was do birds singing Mozart. Uh, because if we, I think if we could understand the birds, we would understand what they were singing. <laughs> so it was uh, the Blues Brothers sings Mozart. And it was a bluebirds, a lot of bluebirds. And I took a, 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 some music for Mozart and I... Uh, I mounted it in my batik. When I first did the mountings, I, I added a different kind of wax. This and this wax is expensive wax. This is not, this is real expensive. This is beeswax mixed with Damar varnish. You heat it up and it is a permanent wax. It doesn't come, it'll age like oil paint does, and it becomes very, very permanent. I added that with heat uh, using a little tool like this, and I really just cut the music out, I, I printed off music, and I added it to the top of a batik. And I could just put it on how I wanted to do it. Well, that became really popular. Everybody loved it. So I started doing more music stuff. And then I realized that I actually could put the music underneath the batik, which makes it a little bit easier for me. It's more durable that way. And then I still use this other wax to do other kinds of things. But this music is mounted underneath the batik. The, um, the reason that that works is because both silk and cotton, when you, wet, when you put wax on them, they're very uh, transparent. So you almost, if I had another drawing underneath here, you could see it. So that's coming from the back side. From the, yeah, well, it's just coming through it. You can just see it. It, it. Because the cloth is transparent enough with the wax on it that you can see through it. So you can make statements. I mean, you can you can put other stuff in there. You don't have to just put music. I used to make double batiks. I'd make two batiks, one superimpose the other, to put subliminal messages and things. So you can do a lot of fun stuff with it by embedding things. 
And because the cloth is so transparent, you, it's transparent when you put the wax in it. So you can do a lot of cool stuff. And I and this is just music that this is Mozart's the sonata from Mozart. And it's I take it on the computer and I, I use Photoshop and I I swirl it. Uh, you do have to be careful with the copyright on, on some music. You can't use certain music and if you're gonna use it you have to contact the people who own it and and ask for permission. I come up with this idea of cutting something up because I was driving across the country. And the scene that I saw in front of me was very pretty in colors, but it was very boring in composition. And I thought, you know, if you could just take that scene and cut it up and rearrange the pieces, you could make an interesting composition. But it was just flat boring. And I went home and told my husband I want to do that. And, um, and he said, well, it could be a lot of work and, and you could waste a lot of time. But it, it ended up not, it, it ended up being very good. And so, if people love them, they love the dimensional work, uh, it just adds more interest. I do about 30 shows a year all over the country. I travel to get my research. I've been to Africa, to Tanzania. Um, I've been to a lot of places. I've been to every state except Hawaii. I haven't been to Hawaii. But uh, one of the advantages of being an artist is you can get to do that stuff. And that's fun. It's a fun part of it. Just put a real simple design and then we'll go over there and we'll dye it. You can use these now. You can use a brush. You can try the brush. You just need to get a feel for what it feels like to do it. It's so hard to draw. I thought there was one that was like all coily. This one's Lego. Oh, no. I have I have a thing like that too, but I didn't bring it. I only have one of those, and I I had it. Uh, I bought it in Scotland actually. Oh, okay, you take you take that heart and, and just take it over here. We're gonna go over here. With it. Let somebody else come in there, and you let's go dye it. The students have made their simple graphic drawings using the janting tool and brushes. Here they add color to their drawings by painting on the dyes. It looks like we have a selection of hearts. The brush off before you go from one to the next. Yeah, you can color it in and it'll, it'll it, just color in all your letters here and then you keep coloring. You need to put it the town. A lot. On this exchange for my first time, I thought it was like really cool because I didn't really like, I didn't really think you could do art out of just wax. I've never seen that before until like a week ago when the teacher started explaining it. And she really made it clear that you have to have make sure like the wax goes through and stuff so that you can see it. And it was really cool that um that you can just do it like that and it's like not even hard. I would have thought that it was really hard. Right. Because the way the way how she explained how there was so many so it, it seemed like she said there was so many steps. But there wasn't there's not really that many steps towards it except for unless you want to do like a lot of color of dyes. But besides that, I don't really see that there's a bunch of steps which makes it really easy. And so this is something you can do because there's not a lot of steps and it's not difficult, huh? Yes. So you can see yourself doing this. Yes. It didn't take long just to do this. It took maybe like okay. really fun. Beth Erlen is one of today's Masters of the Arts. She is also a member of an elite group of artists who recognize the importance of giving back and is willing to take the time to do so. It is my firm belief that art should be a part of every child's life, not just listed as part of the core curriculum and easily cut when the budget gets tight. Visit Beth's website to view more of her work 
and to contact her with any questions or inquiries regarding her work or in-school visits.